Section 8 of Stories of Starland. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Stories of Starland by Mary Proctor. Stories of the Summer Stars. It was a glorious night in June and the stars sparkled like gems against the dark background of the sky. Harry was enjoying the scene, as the doctor had allowed him to spend the warm summer evenings out on the lawn in front of the house. This was a royal treat to him. He could see all the sky at once, he said to his sister, and could look at the stars while she told him stories about them. First of all, there was the Great Dipper in the north, and the Little Dipper with the Pole Star. He was surprised when his sister said that the Great Dipper formed part of the group of stars known as the Great Bear, and he listened intently while she related the story as told in olden times by the Grecians. Legends of the Great Bear The Great Bear was said to be Callisto, the beautiful daughter of Lycaon, king of Arcadia. Juno, the wife of Jupiter, was jealous of Callisto, and threatened to destroy her beauty. Fearing that Juno would harm her, Jupiter changed her into a bear. Her arms grow shaggy and deformed with hair. Her nails are sharpened into pointed claws. Her hands bear half her weight and turn to paws. Her lips, that once could tempt a god, begin to grow distorted in an ugly grin. And, lest the supplicating brute might reach the ears of Jove, she was deprived of speech. Callisto had a son named Arcas, who became a great hunter. One day he roused the bear in the chase, and not knowing that it was his mother, was about to kill her, when Jupiter, taking pity on them both, changed Archas into the little bear. Who was Jupiter? asked Harry. In the olden times he was supposed to live on the top of Mount Olympus with his beautiful wife Juno. When Jupiter was angry with people, it is said he would hurl thunderbolts at them, and when he was pleased he placed them after death among the stars. So he was pleased with Callisto and her son, said Harry. So the story says, replied Mary, but he also seemed to be afraid of his jealous wife Juno. A modern Greek legend gives another account of this constellation or group of stars. It is supposed that at one time the sky was made of glass and it touched the earth on both sides. It was soft and thin, and someone nailed a bare skin upon it and the nails become stars, and the tail is represented by the three bright stars known as the handle of the Great Dipper. Another story is told about a princess who was turned into a bear on account of her pride in rejecting all suitors. For this her skin was nailed to the sky as a warning to other proud maidens. Would you like to hear what the Indians tell about the Great Bear? asked Mary. Indeed I should, replied Harry. I had no idea the Indians looked at the stars. They spend so much time on the open plains that they cannot help noticing them, said Mary, and they tell many strange legends about them. The Iroquois Indians tell the following story about the great bear, which must have seemed like a bear to them, just as it did to the Grecians. Once upon a time, a party of hunters who were in pursuit of a bear were suddenly attacked by three monster stone giants who destroyed all but three of them. These, together with the bear, were carried up to the sky by invisible hands. The bear is still being pursued by the first hunter with his bow, the second hunter carries a kettle, and the third is carrying sticks wherewith to light a fire when the bear is killed. Only in the autumn does the hunter pierce the bear with an arrow, and it is said that it is the dripping blood that tinges the autumn foliage. I like that story, said Harry. Don't you know another bear story? I can tell you one, replied his sister, that is told by the Fox Indians of Louisiana. In the days of long ago, the Indians believed that the trees were able to walk about at night and talk to each other. One dark night, as a bear was wandering homeward through a lonely wood, he was very much surprised to see the trees walking about, nodding their heads and whispering to each other. At first, Mr. Bear thought it was only the wind, but where he saw a mighty oak before him, the next moment he was far behind him or on the other side of the road. Presently he happened to run against a tree. It was the oak, the lord of trees. The oak was angry and reached out one of its long branches and grabbed the bear by the tail. 
The bears struggled all night long to get away, and at last the oak, losing all patience, gave his tail a final twist and hurled him up into the sky. They say his tail was stretched in the struggle. Stories of the Great Dipper That is a funny story, said Harry, enjoying the account of Mr. Bear. Are there any stories about the Great Dipper? I wonder why it is called the Dipper. Because it is supposed to look like a dipper, replied Mary. You can see the four large stars representing the dipper, and the three stars that form the handle. It is known as the saucepan in the south of France, and in other pans of France it is called the chariot of David. In England it is called the plough, and sometimes Charles's wain. That means wagon. In Italy it is known as the car of boots. Boots was supposed to be an ox driver and inventor of the plough. The dipper. One day, the driver, oxen, and plough were suddenly lifted off the earth and placed in the sky. You can see Boots now, and in front of him are the seven stars of the Great Dipper, which he must drive around the pole star for all eternity. A pretty story is told of a peasant who met our saviour near the shores of Galilee and gave him a ride in his wagon. As a reward, he was offered a home in heaven, but he preferred to drive his wagon from east to west for all eternity, and his wish was granted. There stands his wagon in the sky, and the brightest of the three stars is called the rider. In North Germany, the rider is supposed to start out his journey before midnight and return 24 hours later, his wagon turning round with great noise. He urges on his horses with loud cries of hi, he, which it is said have sometimes been heard by lucky morsels. Hush, sister, said Harry softly. Let us see if we can hear him now. No, you could only hear him at midnight, replied his sister. That is, if the story were true. It is only like a fairy story, then, asked Harry. All these stories are fairy stories, replied Mary. And here is another. A Basque legend relates that a certain husbandman had two oxen stolen from him by two wicked thieves. He sent his laborer after them, but he did not return. Then he sent his housekeeper and his dog and finally he decided to go after the thieves himself. He was so angry that he lost his temper, and in punishment for the remarks he made, he was condemned to continue his search through the sky for all eternity. There you can see him now. The two oxen are the first two stars, then follow the two thieves, and lastly the two servants, the husband and the little dog. Where is the little dog? asked Harry. Look at the three stars in the handle of the dipper, replied Mary. Now look at the middle star, and if you have good eyes, you can see a little star close behind it. Here, look through this opera glass and you can see it better. I see it now, said Harry as he looked through the glasses. So that is the little dog? Yes, replied his sister, and the Arabians gave it the name of Alcor. Dear little Alcor, said Harry, as he continued looking at him, I am going to look for you every evening now, because I can see the Great Dipper from my window. So you can, replied Mary. I forgot that it faced north. The American Indians tell a quaint story about the Little Dipper. Would you like to hear it? If you are not tired, sister, said Harry. You will get tired first, for I enjoy telling you these stories, if they amuse you, dear. Well, here is one that I came across some years ago among a collection of Indian legends. Once upon a time, a party of Indians went out hunting in a strange country and lost their way, they wandered about for many moons. What does that mean? asked Harry. I suppose they did not know anything about our months, so they counted from full moon to full moon. This shows how much they observed the sky. But as I was saying, they wandered about for many moons, and at last the chiefs decided to hold a council and pray to the gods to show them the way home. During the dance that preceded the council, while the flames of burnt offerings were ascending to the gods, a little child appears suddenly in their midst, and said she had been sent as their guide. She said she was the spirit of the pole star, and that if they followed where it led them, they would reach their home in the far north. The hunters thanked the child, and following her advice they soon reached home. Here they held another council, and decided to call the pole star, the star which never moves, by which name it is known among these Indians to this day. When the hunters died, it is said they were taken up to the sky, and we can see them still following the pole star. The hunters are supposed to be the stars that form the Little Dipper. They are smaller than the stars of the Great Dipper, said Harry, and the Dipper is smaller, but I can see it quite well. 
And what are the stars between the two dippers? Story of the Dragon They curve in and out like a great dragon, said Mary, and two bright stars mark its eyes. Yes, it does look something like a dragon, said Harry. What's its name? It is called a dragon, and that was the name given to it by the Grecians long ago. This was supposed to be the dragon that Juno placed as guardian of a tree covered with golden apples. No one dared to touch the tree while the dread monster was there. But a brave man named Hercules was not afraid and killed the dragon. To reward it for guarding the tree, Juno placed it among the stars. See the two bright stars that mark the eyes of the dragon, and quite close to it is Hercules, represented in the olden maps as crushing the head of the dragon under his foot. Boots, who drives the great bear around the pole star, is very near Hercules. There you can see him, with his hunting dogs. Where, sister? I cannot see him, said Harry. Look right overhead, and to the west you will see Boots with a very bright star, and to the east is Hercules, or the Nila, as he is sometimes called. Now, in between, there is a pretty little half-circle of stars like a crown. This is called the Northern Crown. Stories of the Northern Crown I can see that very well, replied Harry, for it is exactly overhead, and I cannot help seeing Hercules and the bear driver. They are large enough, he continued laughing. Why are the little stars called the Northern Crown? This was supposed to be a beautiful crown of seven stars given by Bacchus to Ariadne, the daughter of Minos second king of Crete. Her crown among the stars he placed, and with an eternal constellation graced, the golden circle mounts, and as it flies, its diamonds twinkle in the distant skies. There is a pretty legend told about it by the Shawnee Indians. They call this group of stars the Celestial Sisters, on account of the story, which is as follows. White Hawk was a great hunter, handsome, tall and strong. One day, while wandering through the forest in search of game, he suddenly found himself on the borders of a prairie. It was covered with grass and flowers, and a ring was worn through the grass, without any path leading to or from it. White Hawk was surprised at this, so he hid behind some bushes and watched. Soon he heard, high in the heavens, issuing from the feathery clouds, sounds of music quick descending, as if angels came in crowds. Looking up, he saw a small speck in the sky which gradually became larger and larger. It was a silver basket containing twelve beautiful maidens who leaped out as it touched the ground. They danced around in the ring, beating time on a silver ball. Whitehawk gazed at the fairies in wonder, and rushing out from his hiding place, tried to capture the youngest and prettiest. But the sisters were too nimble for him, and jumping into the basket, they were soon far away in the sky. White Hawk was vexed, but he came again next day. This time he disguised himself as a rabbit, but one of the little sisters saw him creeping toward them. She gave the alarm just in time for them to escape. Next day White Hawk disguised himself as a mouse and hid in the stump of a tree that he had moved close to the fairy ring. The sharp-eyed little fairy noticed that the stump was not in the same place and warned her sisters, but they only laughed at her. They even run around it, striking it in fun. Out ran White Hawk, caught the youngest and prettiest, and took her home as his bride. For a while they were happy, but the celestial sister became homesick and longed for her sisters in the sky. One day, when White Hawk was out hunting, she made a silver basket, and taking it to the fairy ring, she stepped into it while she sang a magic chant. White Hawk was returning home across the fields just as the basket rose above the tops of the trees, and hearing the music, he knew what had happened. But his wife did not forget him, and her father sent for him and invited him to come to the sky, where he is now one of the bright stars shining near the northern crown. That must be the brightest star in boots, said Harry. What is it called? Arcturus, replied his sister. Near boots is Virgo the virgin who lived on earth during the golden age when people were very good. Near her are the scales in which she weighed the good and evil deeds of men. Story of the Lion Just above the virgin in the west, you can see some stars that look like a sickle, said Mary. Harry looked in the direction pointed out by his sister, and there he saw the sickle plainly outlined by a few bright stars. Is there a story about it, sister? he asked. 
Yes, replied his sister, or rather there is a story not about the sickle, but about the group of stars to which it belongs, known as the constellation of the lion. You remember how jealous Juno was, and she was even displeased with a brave man named Hercules, because he was afraid of nothing. She told her cousin to command Hercules to bring him the skin of a fierce lion that roamed at large through the forests. Hercules was not afraid, and attacked the lion. Finding he could not kill it with his club and arrows, he strangled the animal with his hands. He returned home carrying the dead lion on his shoulders, but Juno's cousin was so frightened at the sight of it, and at this proof of the great strength of the hero, that he ordered him to tell the story of his brave deeds in future at a safe distance outside the town. "'What a coward Juno's cousin must have been,' said Harry disdainfully. "'I suppose Hercules laughed at him.' "'Of course he did,' said Mary. "'But he was not the only brave man Juno disliked. "'Orion, the mighty hunter, also aroused her anger "'because he boasted that nothing could harm him. "'She sent a scorpion out of the earth, and it stung him, causing his death. "'See the heart of the scorpion, marked by a bright star named Antares.' Above it is the serpent and the serpent holder. The Milky Way Now look at the band of silvery light reaching from the north to the south. That is the Milky Way, and it is made up of millions of bright stars. There are large stars and little stars, and Professor Barnard thinks that there may be some very small stars forming out the star mist. These little stars glitter in vast beds of glowing gas. As scientists believe, this gas is the matter from which worlds and suns are made. The stars at these points in space seem to be actually growing out of the star mist now surrounding them. I shall show you tomorrow some fine photographs Professor Bernard has taken of the Milky Way, where you can see the star mist in the background of the stars. According to a French legend, the stars in the Milky Way are lights held by angel spirits to show us the way to heaven. The Grecians call the Milky Way the road to the palace of heaven. On the road stand the palaces of the illustrious gods, while the common people of the skies live on either side of them. Even the Algonquin Indians had something to say about it, for they believed that it was the path of souls leading to the villages in the sun. As the spirits travel along the pathway, their blazing campfires may be seen as bright stars. Longfellow refers to this in his poem Hiawatha, in describing the journey of Chibiabos to the land of the hereafter. While hunting deer, he crossed the big sea water and was dragged beneath the treacherous ice by evil spirits. By magic he was summoned thence, and hearing the music and singing, he came obedient to the summons, to the doorway of the wigwam, but to enter they forbade him. Through a chink of coal they gave him, through the door a burning firebrand. Ruler in the land of spirits, ruler over the dead they made him, telling him a fire to kindle, for all those who died hereafter campfires for their night encampments on their solitary journey to the kingdom of Ponema, to the land of the hereafter. A Swedish Legend According to the Swedish legend, there once lived on earth two mortals who loved each other. When they died, they were doomed to dwell on different stars, far, far apart. But as they sat and listened to the music of the spheres, they thought of building a bridge of light that should reach from star to star, till it spanned the distance separating them from each other. They toiled and built a thousand years in love's all-powerful might, and so the Milky Way was made a bridge of starry light. Now, Harry, look at the Milky Way in the northern part of the sky, and what do you see? asked Mary. Some stars that look like a W, replied Harry. And just below it is another but larger W. The small W is Cassiopeia, said Mary, and the large one is Cepheus, but I shall tell you their story another time, as it is getting late now. Under the large W, you will see some stars that look like a large cross. This is sometimes called the Northern Cross, but it is better known as the Swan. Legend of the Swan The Swan is supposed to represent a wonderful musician named Orpheus. Apollo gave him a magic harp, which he played with such sweetness that the wild beasts of the forest were tamed by its sounds, rapid rivers ceased to flow, and mountains and trees listened to the music. One day, Orpheus met a beautiful maiden named Eurydice, and won her for his bride. But their happiness did not last long, as a serpent lurking in the grass stung her foot, and she died of the wound. 
Orpheus mourned her sadly, until at last he died and his spirit met hers in the kingdom of Pluto. Afterward, Orpheus and Eurydice were placed among the stars. You can see the harp beside Orpheus, and it is adorned with a sparkling blue star named Vega. And now one more story, said Mary, as she heard the church clock chime nine. And then we must say goodbye to the stars for tonight. It has been lovely, said Harry. I could listen to these stories all night long. How I shall enjoy the stars since you have told me so much about them. What are you going to tell me now? Just under the swan, can you see a bright star and a little star on each side of it? asked Mary. Harry looked, and after a few moments he found them. When his sister had made sure that he could see the star she meant, she began her story as follows. Meeting of the Star Lovers The Japanese call the Milky Way the Silver River of Heaven, and they believe that on the seventh day of the seventh month, 7th of July, the shepherd boy star and the spinning maiden star cross the Milky Way to meet each other. Vega, the bright star in the harp, is supposed to be the spinning maiden, and on the other side of the Milky Way, crossing over where you see the bright star and the little star on each side, you will find the shepherd boy, otherwise known as the goat. These stars are known among the Japanese as the boy with an ox and the girl with a shuttle, about whom the following story is told. There once lived on the banks of the Silver River of Heaven a beautiful maiden who was the daughter of the sun. Night and morning she was always weaving, blending the roseate hues of morning with the silvery tints of evening. That is why she was called the Spinning Maiden. The Sun King chose a husband for her. He was a shepherd boy who guarded his flocks on the banks of the celestial stream. After meeting him, the spinning maiden ceased to work, and the bright hues of morning were left to take care of themselves, while the silvery tints of evening hung like ragged fringe on the dark mantle of night. The sun king, believing that the shepherd boy was to blame, banished him to the other side of the silver river, telling him that only once a year, on the seventh day of the seventh month, could the spinning maiden come to see him. The king called together myriads of doves and commanded them to make a bridge over the river of stars. Supported on their wings, the shepherd boy crossed over to the other side. No sooner had he set foot on the opposite shore than the doves flew away, filling the heavens with their billing and cooing. The weeping wife and loving husband stood a while, gazing at each other from afar, and then they separated, one in search of another flock of sheep the other to ply her shuttle during the long hours of daylight. Thus the days passed away, and the sun king rejoiced that his daughter was busy again. But when night comes, and all the lamps of heaven are lighted, the lovers stand beside the banks of the starry river and gaze lovingly at each other, eagerly awaiting for the seventh day of the seventh month. As the time draws near, the Japanese are filled with anxiety. What if it should rain, for the river of heaven is filled to the brim? and a single raindrop would make it overflow. This would cause a flood, and the bridge of doves would be swept away. But if the night is clear, then the spinning maiden crosses over in safety and meets her shepherd boy. This she does every year except when it rains. That is why the Japanese hope for clear weather on the 7th of July, when the meeting of the star lovers is made a gala day all over the country. Sister, I can see the spinning maiden star and the shepherd boy, but where is the bridge of doves? asked Harry. Across the Milky Way, said Mary. See the bright star, which is called Altair, and one little star on each side. We call that the eagle. So if you change the story a little, you can say the eagle takes the spinning maiden across the silver river of heaven. The Stars and the Violets When the sky was first made and suspended from the far and invisible bars, it enveloped the world and got fashioned, small windows and these are the stars and the bits of sky through the evening fluttered down to the sod and the dew, and behold, in the morn they had blossomed, and these are the violets blue. The Nights Oh, the summer night has a smile of light, and she sits on a sapphire throne, whilst the sweet winds load her with garlands of butter, from the butter to the rose overblown. But the autumn night has a piercing sight, and a step both strong and free, and a voice for wonder, like the wrath of thunder, when he shouts to the stormy sea. And the winter night is all cold and white, and she singeth a song of pain, 
Till the wild bee hummeth, and the warm spring cometh, When she dies in a dream of rain. Adelaide Proctor The Calling of the Stars God's presence through the twilight stillness glides, To spirits vocal, silent to the ear. He calls by name each fair star where it hides, And each star brightens, as it answers, Here! Though we too call the stars, they answer not, They do not softly come like children shy. At the phone parents calling, for I what? We do not know what names God calls them by. End of section 8「Section 9 of Stories of Starland」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Stories of Starland by Mary Proctor Stories of the Winter Stars I heard the trailing garments of the night sweep through her marble halls. I saw her sable skirts all fringed with light from the celestial walls. Longfellow Winter had come with its cold north winds and frosty air. The stars glittered like gems against the dark velvet sky, and seemed reflected in the mantle of pure white snow that covered the earth. Mary had asked Harry's nurse to move his couch into her room so that he might see the stars from the windows, one looking south and the other east. Impatiently Harry now awaited his sister, who had promised to take him on another trip to Starland. The room was in total darkness, and nurse had raised the curtains. Looking right into one window was the mighty giant Orion, while the twins peeped into another. Story of the Royal Family It is as good as a play, said Harry, as his sister started to tell him about them. First of all, she said, I am going to tell you the story of the Royal Family, although we cannot see them from this window. You can get a glimpse of Cepheus from your own room but the rest of the royal family are overhead. You would have to make a hole through the roof if you wanted to watch them while I told the story. If we could go outdoors, as we did last summer, could we see them overhead? asked Harry. Yes, replied his sister, but it is too cold now to look at them except from a warm, cozy room. Tomorrow I shall show you a map of these stars, and when the days grow warm again we can look for them in the sky. Can you see them during the summer time as well as in the winter? asked Harry. Yes, we can see them all year round, just as we can see the Pole Star and the Great Dipper. The royal family consists of King Cepheus, Queen Cassiopeia, and her daughter Andromeda, sometimes called the Chain Lady. Perseus, the rescuer, is at the feet of Andromeda, while her head rests upon the shoulder of the winged horse Pegasus. The Grecians told a wonderful story about this family. It appears that Cassiopeia boasted of her beauty, and said she was more attractive than Juno, the wife of Jupiter. As for her daughter Andromeda, not a nymph in the sea could compare with her in good looks. You may imagine how Juno and the sea nymphs felt when they had this vain boast. They determined to have revenge, and Juno asked Jupiter to punish Cassiopeia. So she was sent away from the earth and placed among the stars with her husband Cepheus. As for Andromeda, the sea nymphs asked Neptune to send a sea monster to devour her. She was chained to a rock so that she might not escape this terrible fate, but just as the monster was approaching, a brave hero named Perseus came to her rescue. Perseus was returning through the air on his winged horse Pegasus from a terrible encounter with the Gorgons. These were three sisters who frightened everyone that saw them. Serpents were wreathed around their heads instead of hair. Their hands were of brass. Their bodies were covered with scales, and their eyes had the power of turning all they looked at to stone. Perseus had cut off the heads of one of these terrible beings, and when he saw the monster approaching Andromeda, he turned the head which he still held in his hand toward it, and in a moment it turned to stone. As a reward for his bravery, he was placed after his death among the stars and near the fair Andromeda. He still holds the head in his hand, and a star named Algol, or the demon, as the Arabs call it, marks the evil eye. Sometimes it is bright, but in a few hours it will grow dim, as though winking at the people on earth. For this reason it is called the variable or changing star. What is that, sister? asked Harry. 
a star that is brighter one time than another. Supposing someone kept turning the wick of the lamp up and down so that at one moment the room would be very bright and the next moment quite dim. You would call that a changing light. So it is with these stars. Only in the case of Algol it is a planet that goes round it and at times cuts off part of its light. For two days and a half it is very bright. Then during three or four hours it begins to get dim and remains so for twenty minutes and then it gets bright again. Supposing you were trying to read by lamplight, and I should now and then hold the book between the lamp and you. Each time I did so, the light on your book would grow dim. There is another variable or changing star named Mira, in the group of stars called Cetus, which is no other than the sea monster which was sent to devour Andromeda. You can see it if you look out the window facing south, and you will notice that it is at a safe distance from Andromeda, who is almost exactly overhead just now. STORY OF THE FISHES Not far from the sea monster are the fishes, and the story about them is as follows. One day, when Venus and her little son Cupid were walking beside the banks of a river, they were frightened at seeing a terrible giant named Typhon. Flames flashed from his eyes, and as he glared at Venus and Cupid, they were overcome with fear and called on Jupiter to help them. He changed them into fishes, and afterwards placed them among the stars. Between Cetus and Orion, you can see some stars winding in and out, and they are part of the river Eridanus. A daring youth named Phaeton tried to drive the chariot of the sun through the sky one day. Jupiter struck him with a thunderbolt and hurled him from heaven into the river below. At once from life and from the chariot driven, the ambitious boy fell thunderstruck from heaven. The breathless Phaeton with flaming hair shot from the chariot like a falling star, that in a summer's evening from the top of heaven drops down, or seems at least to drop. His sisters mourned his unhappy end, and were changed by Jupiter into poplars, which are still to be seen on the banks of the river Eridanus. All the night long their mournful watch they keep, and all the day stand around the tomb and weep. Poor Phaeton, said Harry, as Mary finished the story. And is that Phaeton with those three bright stars near the river? No, that is Orion, replied his sister. And the three bright stars mark his belt. Under it you can see a small cloud of mist, if you look at it through your opera glass. It is clinging around one of those faint stars in the sword. This is star mist, from which other stars are being made, and it looks small only because it is so far away from us. But there is enough stardust there to make thousands of bright stars. Astronomers call these clouds nebulae. Who was Orion? asked Harry. Won't you tell me more about him? He was a mighty hunter, and in the old maps you can see him represented as warding off the attack of the bull, which is glaring at him with its bright red eye named Aldebaran. A story was told by the Grecians about this bull. Once upon a time there was a beautiful little girl named Europa, and she was a princess of Phoenicia. One day she was playing with some friends and gathering flowers in a meadow near the shore. Suddenly, a snow-white ball appeared, and the little children were very much afraid. But the princess was not afraid. She made a pretty garland of flowers and placed it around the bull's neck. When it knelt down in front of her as though to thank her, she jumped on its back, and it ran away with her down to the sea. Plunging under the waves, it swam with her to Crete. The Grecians thought they saw the bull outlined among the stars in the sky, but only its head and shoulders are there. But there are not any animals really in the sky, are there? said Harry. No, said Mary, laughing at the question. But if you look at the stars, you can imagine to see outlines of bulls and serpents and all kinds of strange animals. Only you have to imagine very much, and this is exactly what the Grecians did. In the shoulder of the bull is the pretty little cluster of stars known as the Pleiades. Story of the Pleiades What is a cluster of stars? asked Harry. Hundreds and thousands of stars forming a family party, as it were, and seen from Earth they seem to be closely packed together. But if we could draw near them, however, we should find that they were very far apart. If you look at the Pleiades through your opera glass, you will see quite a number of little stars. And if you could see it through the large telescope at the Lake Observatory, you would be able to count hundreds of stars. 
When the cluster had its photograph taken not long ago, 6,000 stars were counted. So you might call the Pleiades a ball of suns. There are hundreds of these clusters or family parties in the sky, mighty regiments marching across the star depths. What do you mean, sister? asked Harry in surprise. All the stars are moving, replied his sister. Some in one direction, some in another. But the stars in the Pleiades are all drifting in the same direction. The Pleiades were said to be the seven daughters of Atlas, and were so beautiful that Orion pursued them across Wooden Dale till the sisters called on Jupiter to help them. He changed them into doves, and afterward placed them among the stars. Orion still seems to be pursuing them among the stars, but strange to say, they are drifting toward him now instead of away from him. Then he will soon catch them, said Harry, laughing at the idea. I once heard something about the lost Pleiad. What does that mean? One of the seven stars supposed to represent the sisters does not shine as brightly as the rest, so the Grecians called it the lost Pleiad. Some say the lost Pleiad is Electra, who hid her face in her hands so that she might not see the burning of Troy. But she seems to have recovered from her fright, as the star now glows as brightly as the rest. Others said it was Merope, who married a mortal while her sisters married gods. An Iroquois legend accounts for the lost Pleiad by saying that it is a little Indian boy in the sky who is very homesick. When he cries, he covers his face with his hands and thus hides his light. Do tell me about him, said Harry, looking forward to a treat, as he always enjoyed these Indian stories. The story is as follows, said Mary. Story of the Seven Little Indian Boys Once upon a time, seven little Indian boys lived in a log cabin in the woods. Every evening, when the stars peeped out of the sky, these children would take hold of hands and dance around, while they sang the song of the stars, and the stars learned to love them. They would often beckon to the little boys, inviting them to come up to the sky. But the children loved their home on earth too well. But one day, they found fault with everything. The oatmeal was too hot at breakfast, there was an absence of pie at dinner time, and the distressing news that they were only to have corn and beans for supper was a climax to their tale of woe. Meanwhile, their mother calmly ate her supper, while her seven little boys looked on in hungry dismay. When supper time was over, they filed slowly and sadly out of the cabin. Their mother felt sorry for them, it is true, but she knew that if she gave in now, she would have to give in always. She watched her boys as they danced as usual that evening, and sang their song to the stars, and then she hurried into the cabin and cleared away the uneaten corn and beans. Alas, she did not hear the song her children sang to the stars. When the stars beckoned as usual to the little boys, inviting them to come up to the sky, they had accepted the invitation. As they danced round and round, their heads and their hearts grew lighter, and in a moment they were soaring like birds through the air. Just then their mother went to the cabin door to tell them it was time to come home, and imagined the horror when she saw her children slowly disappearing in the sky. And now every evening the lonely mother gazes at the seven bright stars in the sky, which she fondly believes are her seven little boys but which are really the seven stars known to us as the Pleiades. One star in the group does not shine as brightly as the rest, and this must be one of the little Indians who is homesick. I shall never forget that story, said Harry, who had enjoyed every word of it. And now I wish you would tell me about that very bright star on the other side of Orion. I can only just see it, but it is so beautiful. It is bluish white and twinkles so brightly. That is Sirius, the brightest star in this part of the sky, replied Mary, and ever so much larger than the sun. What makes it twinkle? asked Harry. Why the stars twinkle? When we look at the stars, we have to see them through the great ocean of air that surrounds the earth, replied Mary. Like the Atlantic Ocean, when the ocean of air is disturbed, there are waves, and we have to look at the stars through the waves. That is why their light seems to dance about so. When the air is still, then the starlight is steady, but when it moves, the stars twinkle. 
If we could go to the moon, where there is not any air, we would not see the stars twinkle. Then I should rather stay here, said Harry, because I like to watch them dancing about. They seem so merry. I am sure they are laughing at us, sister. Is there a story about Sirius? It is part of a group of stars named the Great Dog, she replied, and higher up you will see the Little Dog. These are the hounds that Orion always took with him when he went hunting. They seem to have even followed him into the sky. Sirius is also known as the Dog Star, because when it was seen by the Egyptians in the east just before dawn, it was thought to announce the overflow of the Nile. Therefore the Egyptians watched this star, which warned them, like a faithful dog, of the coming deluge. It was their watchdog, or sentinel. Now I am going to tell you about the twins, two brothers who loved each other dearly while on earth. They were named Castor and Pollux. Castor was killed in battle. Pollux could not bear to remain on earth without him, so Jupiter placed them in the sky next to his brother. If you look through the glass, you can see that Pollux is a golden yellow star and Castor has a green tinge. Are all the stars colored? asked Harry. The flowers of heaven. Yes, replied his sister, and they are as varied in color as the flowers of the earth. The stars may be called the flowers of heaven. Longfellow says so beautifully, silently one by one, in the infinite meadows of heaven, blossomed the lovely stars, the forget-me-nots of the angels. Some of the natives of Australia believe that when the flowers die on earth, they rise on the winds and float away to the fair fields of heaven, where they flourish forever in immortal beauty. We cannot see the colors of these flowers of heaven very well, on account of the air that surrounds the earth. If it were removed, then the dark sky would seem to be covered with starry flowers of all the colors of the rainbow. How beautiful, said Harry thoughtfully. How I wish we could see them that way. But even as it is, said his sister, you can see some of these colors. Look at white Sirius, that sometimes seems to me tinged with blue, and then at red Aldebaran in the eye of the bull, and a creamy star called Capella just near the twins. So you can see some of the colors. And now a few more words about Castor, which is a double star. That is, it is made up of two bright stars, and they go around each other. Professor Ball was once showing the stars through his telescope to some friends when he pointed out this double star to them. First of all, he told them to note the different colors of the stars, for one was white and the other green. All double stars are of complementary colors. One may be green and the other red, one blue and the other orange. Then Professor Ball told his visitors that the stars went round each other. Oh, yes, said one of the visitors. I saw them going round in the telescope but it was the twinkling that made the stars appear to dance around each other. In reality, he would have had to remain with his eye at the telescope more than a hundred years before he could have seen the stars go completely around each other. Number of the stars I wonder how many stars there are in the sky, sister, said Harry. Do you think we could count them? I read somewhere, replied his sister, that the stars are as plentiful as the sands on the seashore. Still, in the whole sky, the number bright enough to be seen without a telescope is only from six to seven thousand in a clear, moonless sky. With an opera glass, you can bring the number up to one hundred thousand. A small telescope can show you about three hundred thousand, while with a telescope such as the one at the Lake Observatory, the number would be nearly one hundred million. But it is possible to photograph the stars, and millions of stars have had their picture taken. Probably we would never have known anything about them, but the camera caught them, and now they are being named and labeled, so that they cannot escape us again. In fact, some of these stars are so far away that if we had not captured them in this way, they would have remained hidden to us forever. What do you mean, sister? said Harry, his eyes filled with surprise. I mean, dear, that some stars are so far away that their light has not yet reached us. Don't you remember what I told you about Jupiter's moons? that they are so far away that light takes about half an hour in coming from them to the Earth. Well, the stars are hundreds of times as far as Jupiter's moons. So far away are they that even from the nearest, a star seen in the southern hemisphere, light takes four years and four months in reaching us, 
although light travels more than 186,000 miles a second. Distance of the stars Look at the pole star some night, and you will not see it as it is now, but as it was more than 62 years ago. All this time, its light has been on its way to planet Earth. If a planet travels round the pole star, or Polaris, as it is sometimes called, and an astronomer on that planet looked at the Earth, he would not see it as it is now, but as it was more than 62 years ago. There are other stars so far away that light takes hundreds of years in coming here. Perhaps they faded out long ago, but the message is still on its way. It does seem strange to think of people who may be living on distant worlds in space, watching our little world, but we need not fear. The Earth is so small that it could not be seen at all, even from the nearest star. At that distance, giant sun would not look quite as bright as Sirius does to us, and giant planet Jupiter would only appear as a faint speck of light near the sun. How far away everything seems to be, said Harry. Yet you said just now that we could tell what the stars are made of. How can we do that? What are the stars made of? The stars are made of iron, copper, zinc, and other such metals, but the heat is so intense that these metals are turned into vapor. You have seen the steam coming from the spout of a kettle when water is boiling, and you know then that the water is scalding hot. But imagine heat so great that masses of iron and copper are not only melted but turned into vapor. Then you have some idea of the intense heat that prevails on the stars. The rains that fall on Earth are made up of drops of water, but the rainfalls on the stars must be drops of melting iron, while the clouds that form are sheets of molten metal. How wonderful, said Harry. And how do we know this, as the stars are so far away? By means of a little instrument known as the spectroscope, or light sifter. But you must wait till you're a little older before I can explain that to you, as it is something very difficult to understand. At any rate, I can tell you this, that when we want to find out what a star is made of, we catch a ray of its light and examine it with a light sifter. As Professor Ball quoted in one of his lectures, Twinkle, twinkle, little star, now we find out what you are, when unto the midnight sky we the spectroscope apply. And can you tell how old the stars are? asked Harry. Because when you were talking about the planets, you said some are old and some are young. This same little spectroscope tells us that as well, and we can recognize the stars that are in their infancy, and others that are middle-aged or nearly worn out. How strange to think of worn-out stars, said Harry. Yet I suppose they must grow old sometime, just as we do. Only I suppose they take ever so much longer growing up. Hundreds of years, said Mary, laughing at the idea of grown-up stars. There are young stars and old stars, and even the star that gives us light and heat will grow cold and dead some day, and not warm its planets any longer. But that will be millions of years hence, long after we are dead and gone. Our Island Universe So it is all over the heavens. Our little universe is like an island in space. There are other islands like our own, with their millions of stars and star clusters and star mist, passing through periods of youth, middle age, old age and decay. Our little universe is not eternal, it cannot last forever, but as long as it does we should feel glad that we are here to enjoy it. Now Harry, I really think we have had quite a long ramble in Starland for one evening, and I believe two little stars I know need a rest. They are a little tired, said Harry, smiling. Two little worn-out stars, sister. And perhaps they do want to let the curtains down over them for a while. I believe they do, said Mary softly, and the stars were hidden by their curtains almost before she had said the words. Winkin, blinkin, and nod. Winkin, blinkin, and nod one night, sailed off in a wooden shoe, sailed on a river of crystal light into a sea of dew. Where are you going, and what do you wish? the old man asked of the three. We have come to fish for the herring fish that live in this beautiful sea. Nets of silver and gold have we, said Wink and Blink in a nod. The old moon laughed and sang a song as they rocked in a wooden shoe, and the wind that sped them all night long ruffled the waves of dew. The little stars were the herring fish that lived in the beautiful sea. Now cast your net wherever you wish, never a fear that we. So cried the stars to the fishermen three, wink and blink and nod. All night long their nets they threw, for the stars in the twinkling foam. 
Then down from the sky came the wooden shoe, bringing those fishermen home. It was also pretty a tale it seemed, as if it could not be. And some folks thought was a dream they dreamed, of sailing that beautiful sea. But I shall name you the fishermen three, Wink and Blinken and Nod. Winken and Blinken are two little eyes, and Nod is a little head. And the wooden shoe that sailed the skies is a wee one's trundle bed. So shut your eyes while mother sings of wonderful sights that be. And you shall see the beautiful things as you rock in the misty sea. Where the old shoe rocked the fishermen three, wink and blink and nod. Eugene Field Seven Little Indian Stars By Mrs. S. M. B. Piat Seven little Indian boys were they, dancing with the moonbeams on a mound. In the wind they all were whirled away, and the fireflies searched the dews around. Seven little Indian stars are they, seven and only one, my child is dim. That's the singer, the sad stories say. That's the singer, let us pity him. Oh, the little singer, you can see, he's not shining as the others are. Once, when all the stars made wishes, he wished he didn't have to be a star. St. Nicholas, March, 1890 why the Stars Twinkle by Oliver Wendell Holmes When Eve had led her load away, and Cain had killed his brother, the stars and flowers, the poets say, agreed with one another. To cheat the cunning tempter's art, and show the world its duty, by keeping on its wicked heart the eyes of love and beauty. A million sleepless lids, they say, will be at least a warning, and so the flowers will watch by day. The stars from eve to morning on hills and prairies fields and lawn their dewy eyes upturning the flowers still watch from reddening dawn till western skies are burning alas each hour of daylight tells a tale of shame so crushing that some turn white as sea bleached shells and some are always blushing and when the patient stars look down on all their light discovers the traitors smile the murderers frown their lips of lying lovers. They try to shut their saddening eyes, and in the vain endeavor, we see them twinkling in the skies, and so they wink forever. Taken from the Autocrat of the Breakfast Table. End of section 9. Section 10 of Stories of Starland. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Stories of Starland by Mary Proctor God bless the star. Darling, I'm feeling so tired this evening, when you sit beside my bed and hold my hand in yours while you tell me about the stars. His sister Mary suggested lighting the lamp and reading a story, but he held her hand with gentle force, saying, do not light the lamp. Leave the curtain up so that I can see the stars from my window, and tell me in your own words that story you told me of a star the other day. Dickens' story of a star. Don't you remember, sister? Still holding his little hand in hers, and giving it a loving pressure, she rested her head on the pillow beside his, and began in low soft tones. There was once a beautiful bright star that shone down upon the home of a little boy and girl who wondered at its light. They learned to know it so well that every evening the one who saw it first would say, I see the star, and before they went to sleep at night, they would say, Good night to the star, and God bless the star. But the little girl, where she was still very young, became very weak and feeble so that she was unable to go to the window and look at the star, so the brother would stand there alone and watch for it. As soon as he saw it, he would turn round to his sister and say, I see the star, and the little sister would answer gently, God bless my brother and the star. One evening the brother looked at the star alone, for his little sister had passed away to her home among the stars. That was a sad and lonely evening for the brother, and at night he dreamed of his sister. Her face seemed to be looking at him from the bright star, and he could see a pathway of light reaching from it to his room. Along the pathway were people passing from this earth to the stars. Angels waited to receive them, 
and as they reached the star people came out to welcome them. Kissing their friends tenderly, they went away together down avenues of light. But there was one who waited patiently near the entrance of the star, and asked the guide who led the people thither if her brother had not yet come. Not yet, he replied kindly. And as she turned away sadly, the little brother reached out his arms toward her and said, Here I am, sister, I'm coming to you. As she turned her beaming eyes on him, the star was shining into the room, and he could see its rays of light through his tears. From that hour, the child looked on that star as his view to home, where he would some day meet his angel sister again. And he waited, oh, so patiently, and the years rolled slowly by. He grew to manhood, and still the star shone down upon him at night. Then he grew to be an old man with gray hair and wrinkled face, and his steps were slow and feeble. Others had gone before him to the star. A little brother who died while he was young, his mother, his daughter, and now surely his own time had come. One night he lay upon a bed of sickness, and as his children gathered round him, he suddenly cried out, as he had long ago, I see the star. Then they whispered to each other, He is dying. And he heard them and said, I am, my age is falling from me like a mantle, and I move toward the star as a child. And O oh, my father, now I thank thee that the star has so often opened to receive those dear ones who await me. And next day the star was shining, and it still shines upon his grave. Harry had been lulled to sleep by the sound of his sister's voice, and in a dim light Mary could see that he was smiling in his dreams. Were his dreams, she wondered, about stories of Starland? Crossing the bar. Sunset an evening star, and one clear call for me, and may there be no moaning of the bar when I put off to sea. But such tide as moving seems asleep, too full for sound and foam, when that which drew from out the bundless deep turns again home. Twilight an evening bell, and after that the dark. And may there be no sadness of farewell when I embark. For though from out are born of time and place, the flood may bear me far. I hope to see my pilot face to face when I have crossed the bar. Tennyson Ye golden lamps of heaven Ye golden lamps of heaven, farewell, with all your feeble light. Farewell, thou ever-changing moon, pale empress of the night. And thou, refulgent orb of day, in brighter flames arrayed, my soul that springs beyond thy sphere, no more demands thine aid. Ye stars are but the shining dust of my divine abode, the pavement of those heavenly courts where I shall reign with God. Father of eternal light shall there his beams display, nor shall one moment's darkness blend with that unvaried day. Philip Doddridge End of section 10 Recording by Martha, Onser, Denmark End of Stories of Starland by Mary Proctor